Whoops. Well, hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Reverend Cassandra Ray, Director of the Center for Spiritual Living White Rock. We are an inclusive spiritual community located well, you know, we're based out of White Rock, South Surrey, British Columbia, Canada. And now that we're online, we are here to serve the globe. And we envision a world that naturally expresses love. We practice and teach tools for transformation, for your authentic self-expression, and for conscious living. And so wherever you are on your path, whether you're soaring or struggling, there's a place for you here. And as we get going, I've, I wanted to um, just recognize that I'm wondering if, if you felt um, a little bit more of, of overwhelm this last week or a little bit of stress or an easiness to get agitated. I, I noticed it within myself and in many, many different circles around me. And I just wanted to let you know that if, if that's happening in your life, you're not alone. <laughs> yeah. It's so natural and normal with what's going on for us to feel a little bit of extra overwhelm and stress. And so part of how we embrace that here is by intentionally practicing gratitude. And it's a gratitude that helps us face our life and our challenges, not avoid them. And so as we begin here today, I want to just take a moment of intentional gratitude. And so I invite you to, to just feel the gratitude that I have for you in this moment. I'm so grateful for your presence here today. I'm grateful for everyone who has donated and given to our community. Just thank you so much for being a part of us and for supporting this work of an empowered spirituality that embraces you, supports you, and loves you, regardless of what you're going through. I believe it is this kind of community that will heal the world and lead the way to new levels of creativity, collaboration, and inclusion. So thank you for being here today. And now it's time for our opening song as we all get to... We, for those of us here together on Zoom, live in, in the moment on Sunday, we've just enjoyed such a beautiful guided meditation from Tamara. Thank you, Tamara. It helps, that moment of meditation helps prepare the way for opening to receive this message that we're about to hear. And also our, our meditation practice uh, helps us to open up to our own intuitive guidance. And so as we connect here today through this message, I invite you to listen through your own inner wisdom as you focus on, on what is supporting the highest and best in you today. And, you know, during this time of great change, we have an opportunity to pause with purpose. Mm -hmm. Just like meditation, right, is a pause with purpose. With increasing acts of self-care, we can create a space for new awareness with deeper alignment with our soul's calling. And each one of us is tasked to discover our sacred work, our gifts, our talents, and contributions to the world. And yet, how do we do that, especially when everything's changing? We've been using The Great Work of Your Life by Stephen Cope as a guide to discover, claim, and fulfill our purpose. He calls that our dharma. You see, he uses the Bhagavad Gita, which is a sacred spiritual text from ancient Indian tradition that tells the story of Arjuna and Krishna. And they teach us about our dharma, your unique and divine purpose. 
And just to recap, uh, the four pillars of Dharma are number one is to look to your Dharma. Number two is to do it full out. And number three is to let go of the fruits. And number four is to turn it over to God. Now, I'm just going to copy and paste this in the chat for everybody who's here live with us. Uh, we have been going over this topic for a few weeks now. So the, we did pillars one and two in the last two weeks. And today we are focusing on let go of the fruits. And so what does it mean to let go of the fruits? Krishna explains to Arjuna, you have the right to work but never to the fruit of the work. And he's teaching here about the power of non-attachment. He encourages us to give yourself entirely to your work, your dharma, but let go of the outcome, he says. Be alike in success and defeat. What? This is mind-blowing for me. And Krishna is teaching here that clinging to the outcome, that it does three things. It disturbs, obscures, and separates the mind. And as it turns out, clinging to the outcome is another form of doubt, which was Arjuna's initial problem that he was faced with, you know, way back a couple weeks ago when we started this discovery. He was stuck in between a rock and a hard place, and he didn't know what to do. And that is what prompted this entire conversation between Arjuna and Krishna. So clinging to the outcome actually ends up clouding our judgment. And Stephen Cope says, it intensifies the split between subject and object, so that it appears that without the object of my grasping, I am unwhole. Whoa. So if I don't achieve my goals and succeed, then I am unwhole. That's the trap here. That's the false belief. And doesn't that, that sounds like our culture, right? We get so focused on success as a way to validate ourselves. And yet here we are with Krishna saying, now you got to let go of what happens. So he's teaching us this non-attachment, but he's also advising us at the same time to give yourself wholeheartedly. Okay. Okay. So you're just letting go of how it unfolds or whether or not you succeed. But Cope tells us that it's, that it's an important part of, of non-attachment to let go of the outcome. But he says that does not mean detachment from the passionate involvement in the task at hand. So not detachment from one's dharma, but detachment from the outcome. Okay, so you hold on with one hand while letting go with the other. So Krishna says, when the mind is not colored by grasping, it is free, free of disturbance, obscuration, and separation. The mind is at ease. It is seeing clearly, and it is in union with all beings, non-separate. And when the mind is in this excellent and most refined state, we are free to truly absorb ourselves in Dharma. This is unified consciousness. And actually, letting go of the outcome is freeing you to pour yourself into it even more, which to me sounds a little bit counterintuitive, especially when there's this natural human desire to strive, to want and to strive. Well, the cool thing about this yoga tradition is that the yogis found that not all desire is harmful. While they're teaching non-attachment, they're also teaching that there's a certain kind of desire that helps us live our dharma, and it's called 
aspiration. So aspiration are the energies of desire that inspire you to make a commitment and, and, and that then drive this determination to self-actualize the best aspects of our humanity. So, you know, wanting to succeed isn't a bad thing, but we're starting to, to, to like tease apart this difference between like it has to turn out this way versus pouring ourselves in passionately and yet with non-attachment. So Cope tells us that the practitioner can, in fact, tease grasping apart from aspiration by harnessing desire to dharma, which frees the natural passion of the human being to put in the service of dharma. Okay, all right. So instead of trying to control the outcome or be, it has to look a certain way, then if I dedicate my desire to my dharma, to actualizing my divine purpose, then I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in alignment and take action in ways that really serve everyone. And so here we are, letting go of the fruit allows us to fully engage in living our dharma. And Stephen Cope is so good. Krishna is so good because the Bhagavad Gita gives us three principles. For those of you who are here, I just uh, pasted them in the chat. There are three important principles we're going to talk about today uh, as, as part of letting go of the fruit. And this first one is let desire give birth to aspiration. The second, when difficulties arise, see them as your dharma. And the third, turn the wound into light. So what does it mean to let desire give birth to aspiration? In the great work of your life, Cope uses a story of poet John Keats to show us what it means to let desire give birth to aspiration. Keats fell in love with poetry and he resolved to become a poet. Then he began trying it on, practicing being a poet, even dressing like he thought a poet would dress. And a big turning point for him came when he found a mentor, an exemplar of his dharma. And Cope writes, what role do these exemplars play? We see in them the full expression of a kindred dharma. We see in them the full flower of what we know exists as a seed within our own self. These exemplars become essential doorways for us into our own dharma. So seeing your dharma in someone else has, well, and not exactly your dharma, it's like your kindred dharma, or even seeing somebody who's matured in their dharma. This has the power to awaken your own unique genius. Keats went into deliberate practice, something we focused on in last week's talk. And then he let go of his plan B. You see, Keats was also training to become a doctor. And at a certain point, he let it go. He was willing to commit to his passion, his dharma, and to risk failure. As Keats continues to write and create, he realizes that striving for praise, I mean, that's something that's pretty big in poetry, right? Like, you're not going to be successful if you don't, people don't like your work? Maybe? Mm -mm. We're going to find out something different from Keats. So he realizes that his own experience of writing is way more important than what other people think of his writing, whether they praise it or not. And so he learned to give himself to his craft. And so Cope writes about Keats. At regular moments during his work, 
he had experienced a surrender to some greater power. He would, say, he would later say, that which is creative must create itself. So he discovered, as all great artists do, that there was something impersonal at work, something at work that was not him, and to surrender to this larger force gave him a new kind of freedom and a new sense of faith in the process itself. He realized, just as Krishna taught Arjuna, that he was not the doer. That which is creative must create itself. Mm, this is so beautiful because Keats learned that while his poetry came through him, that it didn't belong to him. He was meant to experience it in the creative process, just like people were meant to experience it in, in reading it. And that the experience of writing and creative, creating was what brought him deep meaning and purpose, not the acclaim of others. So Cope writes, Keats always had the sense that his greatest poems came from somewhere beyond him, that he was just the channel for them, and his life's work was to prepare himself to channel these poems. And so as you walk your own Dharma path, your path of purpose, I ask you to reflect upon your life. What? What? did you fall in love with? What have you fallen in love with in your life? What lights you up? And what might you be preparing yourself for now? And how do you prepare yourself? I'm gonna just copy and paste these questions that are for you. These questions are for you to take into your spiritual practice during the week. So the second principle in letting go of the fruits is when difficulties arise, see them as dharma. Oh, this is so timely right now, eh? So Cope says, when difficulties arise, give yourself to them. Go into the heart of the difficulty. Experience it. Investigate it. Take yourself into the center of the conflict. Learn to tolerate its discomfort without acting or reacting. And what do you find at the heart of fear, dread, loathing, anger, hatred? You find a surprise. You find a gift. A gift? In life's challenges? Okay. <laughs> and this is the part of the process where we get to face the fact that in order to fully walk our life path, that we also must learn how to walk through pain, discomfort, loss, and just overall unpleasantness. Because it's part of our human experience. And what's so cool about this part of the Bhagavad Gita is that it's, it's viewing these challenges not as barriers, which I often think of life's challenges as like stopping me from being or doing what I want, but these, we're, we're starting to look at them in a different way. So Cope says, your dharma is the work that is called forth from you at this moment, and like everything in this impermanent world, the work of the moment can change on a dime. Okay. So if our challenges aren't a barrier and we're meant to be with them instead of deny them, now Cope is saying that your dharma can change depending upon what you're going through. Now, now this can be both a little bit confusing uh, because we like to like know, <laughs> we like to know where we're at, where we're going and how to get there, right? But in this particular part, it's, it's about instead of knowing, it's about being present with yourself 
And, and, and what I would like for you to focus on in this part is, is that no matter what happens in your life, because you know, there are times when something happens and it derails us, right? And all of a sudden we're like, ah, it's okay. That's your Dharma too. Not that you, you have to go through challenges in order to live your Dharma. You don't, but if they happen, if you get ungrounded, if it's challenging you, you can breathe and remember that that's okay, that this is your Dharma too. Now it might shift, you might shift and change through this, but if you're willing, willing to let go of how you thought it should unfold, then you might find some gifts in your challenges in your walk. In this part of the book, Cope tells the story of Marion Woodman to demonstrate this principle. And Marion Woodman was a teacher turned Jungian analyst who faced cancer in her 40s. She ended up going in remission and living twice as long. Uh, but she faced many a challenge on her path and her dharma changed drastically during her life. And she wrote in her journal, when God is moving you toward a new consciousness, you need to recognize the winds of change at once. Move with them instead of clinging to what is already gone. Move with them instead of clinging to what is already gone. You know, I just um, sometimes get a little overwhelmed when I realize that, you know, pre-pandemic is already gone. Post-pandemic is going to be different than pre-pandemic. And part of me feels the grief and loss, and part of me feels the hope for renewed passion and possibility for our earth and for each other, for how we live together. I will admit though that there is part of me that is clinging to what is already gone, absolutely. Even knowing that it's more powerful to let go. I set the intention and I stay present with myself. And Marion, Woodman, she understood, and, and this is something else that she said. She said, longing for our idealized images of life separates us from our true selves and from our true callings. She said, always through illness, God picked me up, dropped me on the new road, and said, walk. Walk. Oh, man. It does feel like God has picked us all up and put us all on a new road and said, walk. And I'm just grateful actually that I'm not on that road alone because it's hard sometimes. It's hard sometimes to be dropped on a new road. But what cope, tells us and I want to remind you of today is that this road, whether it is new or old, is part of your dharma. It's okay to be challenged. It's okay to switch course. And it's okay to feel your way through it. In fact, you must feel your way through it. Your divine purpose will not abandon you. It's guiding you even now especially now, especially now. The third principle in letting go of the fruits is to turn the wound into the light. And in this section, Cope tells the story of Beethoven. Beethoven, a talented and tortured man who transcended all the odds, gave himself to his craft, and discovered that his work was mightier than his suffering. His work, his dharma, 
was mightier than his suffering. Man, and he had a lot of suffering. I mean, if you don't know, this is a musician who went deaf. I mean, that's like a runner losing their legs, right? I mean, ouch. But Krishna teaches us that work performed in the thrall of Dharma has a life of its own. And authentic Dharma turns suffering into light. Authentic Dharma turns suffering into light. Something that Beethoven discovered in his life experience is that there was a connection between the wound and the gift. And that in fact, the wound was an aspect of the gift and they can't be divided. Mysteriously, the, the gift is actually oftentimes born out of the wound. That at the very least, the gift makes sense of the wound. It gives it meaning, helps us make meaning of the wound in our own life. So when you think back on your life, and the challenges you've faced, you might be able to see a theme in your struggles. This theme, this common thread, that could be the wound in you. And oftentimes we see this as our greatest weakness, something that we must do our work in order to eliminate or get over or get beyond. But what if the wound? was trying to birth your gift. What if the gift in you has the power to transform every challenge into wisdom that supports your greatest unfoldment? If this were true, and if you were to allow this to be true, could you be gentler with yourself? Might you be more compassionate about what you may have called your weakness? Might you be compassionate with your own triggers? Krishna says, your soul can be saved only through action in the performance of your own dharma. Now, I don't believe that your soul needs to be saved, but I do see the healing power of action in support of your dharma. And today's central message is to let go of the outcome. Your experience is paramount. Your passion is important. And any challenge along the way is ultimately for you. It is for you. So during this next week, take some time to think about who is your exemplar? Who is demonstrating something that you are wanting to demonstrate for yourself? And dedicate some time and energy to nurturing your heart, tending to your purpose. Because when you nurture yourself, that is nurturing your dharma. That is nurturing your purpose. And the world needs your dharma, even now, especially now, especially now. And so it is. Close your eyes, center yourself. I recognize. In this moment, that there is a loving presence that connects everyone and everything, a source of wisdom, a source of love, a source of healing, wholeness. I call this source God, I call it spirit. I know that it is this infinite intelligence of cosmic harmony of infinite abundance 
And I know that it loves each and every one exactly where everyone is in their dharma, on the road of life. I recognize that I am one with this great source, this great love, that it is flowing to me and through me as me. And I recognize that when I open and receive this union with spirit, that my consciousness, that the power of my word is amplified. And so I amplify my power right here in this moment through this divine connection as I claim, affirm, and know that each one present here right now is absolutely a manifestation of divine love itself. That each one has seeds of genius inside that are already shining a light on the way forward. I know that there is a source of peace within each one that is greater than any challenge that might come up this week or next or in life. I know that every challenge that has come up is actually in service to the highest and best expression of each one here today. And so I breathe. I breathe in that love and that power. And I am so grateful for the ways in which each one here has been gifted with the gift. That each one here is such a crucial, monumental, important presence in this lifetime. That it is not a mistake that we're here together right now. That each one of us is part of this unfoldment of a new consciousness that naturally expresses love and dharma. And so what I know is that everyone who walks away from this, this message today, that there is a renewed sense of power and grace that continues to unfold in this week, that this week is a new opportunity to be present, to be on the road together, hand in hand. I'm so grateful that I'm not on this path of Dharma by myself. And I'm so grateful for each and every exemplar who's gone ahead and shined a light on the way, knowing that it is easier because of every exemplar. And what I know is that each one here is an exemplar for someone else. And so what beauty it is that we magnify each other's heart and soul. What beauty it is that we hold space for each other's humanity and divinity. And so I know that great things are on their way, that this prayer is answered already. And so I let it go. I fully release any attachment to outcome of this prayer, knowing that it actually unfolds way more magnificent than I can even imagine. And I recognize that letting it go, letting it be, is the best thing I can do for this prayer. And so I give myself, I surrender to this divine unfoldment. I let it be, and so it is. And taking in a breath, coming back to the planet here with you. Now is time for our sacred giving recognizing that the highest purpose of money is love we give where our souls are fed knowing that it nourishes the world returns to us multiplied abundantly so we gratefully appreciate your gifts ties and offerings you can give on our website at csl-whiterock.com super simple and secure and you can make a one-time or reoccurring donation, and gifts of all sizes are helpful. Your contribution, your presence, it makes such a difference. Thank you for anything you're able to give at this time. I have a few announcements here uh, for this week of new additional ways that you can continue to connect and grow again community. Every Tuesday in May at 9.30 a.m., one of our licensed practitioners, Jill Ingalls, is offering a group meditation on Zoom. 
and every Thursday in May at 3.30 p.m., another licensed practitioner, Tamara Rossander, is leading a guided meditation on Facebook Live. So you can find all the details you need on our website, right there on our homepage, so that you can join in during the week to take a breath and be present with your dharma and get your soul fed. We're building a library of guided meditations on our YouTube channel so that you can have them whenever you need them. I'm just going to um, post that in the chat. And this coming week in my workshop series, Creating Through Change, we are delving into aligning our lives with our values and intentions. Each week, we learn new skills and tools so that we can create an inner environment that nurtures the soul and facilitates authentic expression. You can sign up still today. It's not too late. And you can join us this Wednesday at 10 a.m. or Thursday at 7 p.m. We have two offerings of the same course. I also want to welcome two new board members to your CSL White Rock board. Min Ta and Tim St. Dennis have both recently joined our board. And today I wanna to tell you a little bit more about Tim. Next week, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Min. But Tim has been attending CSL White Rock since 2015. He served on the board of directors for two years starting in 2016 and as president in 2017. He's taken many courses during his membership with CSL and has experienced immense spiritual growth during this time. Recently, after a career spanning over 40 years, Tim retired from his profession as a chiropractic doctor. During that time, he served on several board positions at the provincial and national levels. Tim has a son who lives in Toronto and a daughter who lives in, oh, I'm gonna say it wrong. Uh, I want to say Gat now, but I thought they said, oh, I can't remember. Okay, you know what I'm talking about because it's in Quebec, which allows him to enjoy his new role as a spiritual mentor to them and also as a proud grandparent. Oh, I look forward to those days, Tim. He's enthusiastic about joining the Board of Pre Trustees of CSL White Rock and the spiritual growth that comes with it. Now, Tim, I didn't ask you, but are you willing to say hello? And I can't unmute you, but you got to unmute yourself. And sit. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. And uh, I look forward to serving. Yay. Thank you so much, Tim. Well, that is the end of our announcements. I thank you so much for being here today. Uh, and blessings on your week. We're going to stop our recording as we